Welcome to the Modern Hippie Podcast, where we'll be exploring all of my favorite boundary-pushing people and topics surrounding consciousness, psychedelics, mental performance, functional medicine, living in alignment, and so much more. I'm your host, Barrett Perlman, a former pro wakeboarder turned body worker, energy healer, and well, a modern hippie. And I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back to the Modern Hippie Podcast. I am joined today by Martin O'Toole, who is the host of the How to Die Happy Podcast and psycho-spiritual author of the book by the same name. Thank you so much for joining me today, Martin. Hi, Barrett. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic. How are you? I am really rather well, and I'm very excited to be having this conversation with you. You are actually the, uh, the second podcast interview I've ever done as a guest. What? That's phenomenal. I'm so excited. What a beautiful honor. So I should be nervous, I suppose, because I'm quite shy and retiring. Mm, Well, you probably shouldn't be nervous because you have your own podcast. And so you're very adept at this, (laughs) which is also why (laughs) your camera is so much more beautiful and uh, cinematic on your face than mine is. What's that expression? All the gear and no idea. I think that's uh, (laughs) that's an appropriate descriptor for my podcast. uh, technical abilities. Yeah. Well, so you and I met um, on Instagram of all things, which is kind of becoming my new MO, which I may or may not be so proud to admit. Um, But I sort of noticed that you were following me and started listening to your podcast and then was like, oh my God, who is this gem of a human being? And it just resonated so deeply with your stories that you've been sharing and was thrilled to find out that you have ended up turning, taking all that knowledge and turning it into a book, um, which as you and I started talking then, um, discovered all these parallels between what my life experience has been and what your life experience has been. And, um, you know, I too was starting to write a book about called how to find happiness, but now I just feel like you you kind of went ahead and did it. And so (laughs) I'm just going to honor and push your book. So yeah. (laughs) Very kind, very kind. What, um, so I I hope I haven't stifled your creativity there. I, 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 I'm sure there's still a place for your book in the world. I'm sure there is different, different voices and things, right. But, um, just, uh, always trying to divide time and, um, figure out where it's best spent. And right now for me, it doesn't feel like a book is where my time is best spent, but mm. I love it. It is very time consuming. That's for sure. Yeah. And so I greatly enjoyed reading your book. You got me an advanced copy and I would love to just sort of deep dive into your journey. Um, I mean, you were a total fucking wreck before you got sober and found out <laughs> That's that's accurate. <laughs> so, could you just walk me through a little bit of um, my listeners through what you were going through before you started to embark on this journey of wellness? Yeah, well, I think wreck or, or tram smash or train crash are all appropriate descriptors. I was um, like flying headlong into my into my mid forties still uh, a high-functioning alcoholic, high-functioning uh, cocaine addict. I was a, an ad man, or madman, as, as some people call them, or call us, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I, I had so many issues that I'd, that I'd not dealt with. And uh, as I refer to in the books, a lot of spilt milk under burnt bridges across mm-hmm. a scorched landscape, you know, um, of these uh, incredible... Uh, very messy uh, interactions that I had with so, so many people, family and friends and business partners and you name it, you know, I made a, a real, a considerable mess. And I, and I got to the point where I, I hit rock bottom. I think it was, um, it was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very straightforward process. It was 2015 when I, I, I eventually had a bottle of gin inside me and a, a loaded shotgun to my, to my face. And I was, you know, this close from, from killing myself. Um, mm. 
and actually my beagle talked me out of it which uh you will have read in the in the book um yeah. there's a chapter called last last night a beagle saved my life um mm -hmm. and uh and that beagle macy uh actually becomes you know she's she's a she's a star in in the book in a way because um because i tell a couple of stories about her um because she she offered me so many lessons but she stopped me from from killing myself um I'd, I then realized I needed to seek help. So I went to start to see a traditional therapist and that did some work that did some good work, but ultimately not enough. And then fast forward to 2018, um, my body was seriously broken after more drinking. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, uh, torn my meniscus in my knee, which, uh, I don't know if, if people would know that it's a very painful mm. thing. Um, uh, all being drunk and uh and then i i just realized uh, i had to quit drinking so i quit drinking and i'd been sober for the best part of a year but i was in i was living in life uh, living life in london i'd been there for uh, nearly four years i was surrounded by lots of people still drinking and using it's safe to say i wasn't really supported by those around me um mm. uh, to, in terms of you know trying to trying to give up and stay away from this sort of thing and then I was getting, I had another nervous breakdown. I was pretty close to, to using again. And then I discovered ayahuasca. Mm. Well, ayahuasca and machuba, actually. Uh, I was in the Moroccan Atlas Mountains at a, a private event where we did uh, two back-to-back -back ceremonies, ayahuasca, wachuma, ayahuasca, wachuma. And it's wow. safe to say that changed my, my universal perspective as we know and of course your listeners will know uh tends to happen when you work with with plant medicines yeah wow i'm, I'm like really jealous also that you did that in morocco because i was there like a year ago and there were no plant medicine i didn't do any plant medicines at all while i was there so um well you're not supposed I to are you i don't think but uh <clears throat> hopefully they'll let me back in the country uh, by <laughs> making this admission wow um yeah. And so one of our parallels there is that um, also for me, plant medicine was what changed everything on a night that I was um, getting ready to kill myself. And also my dog was there. And through the plant medicines, I was walked through how to love myself again by utilizing the love that I felt for my dog. And then it instructed mm. me to like flip a mirror in between that heart space. And it came back and blasted on me. And immediately I was overcome with self-love, which I'd never felt in my life before. And so, That's um, beautiful. yeah, I'm curious what it was about those plant medicine journeys that you discovered that everything would shift. That's a great question. Well, <clears throat> obviously everyone's plant medicine journey is different, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so we all have very different experiences, but then I, I, I my, because I've done a lot of work with plant medicine since, uh, clearly, um, and there are some common denominators. So one of the common denominators is that um, that we will be presented with uh, past traumatic stories, events, but presented them in a different way, right? The the, mm. the way the grandmother ayahuasca can can present it. So um, so I, I I guess I'll just ex explain my experience, but I'm, I'm conscious that your audience will be fami familiar with these medicines, but for me it was um it was trauma after trauma represented you know pulled out of the subconscious unconscious where i where i'd done a great deal of work burying it right and mm -hmm. um and then i was represented with these events but i wasn't just represented them with my perspective you know i, I was present i was represented them with the universe's perspective I, I like to say there are three there are three sides to every story there's there's my mm -hmm. truth there's your truth, and then there's the the actual truth, the universal truth, <laughs> or all that is the, the perspective of all that is, and mm -hmm. um, and th that's what the medicine did for me. Uh, she presented uh, all of these events back to me um, in a way that I could instantly a see the other perspectives of the people uh, who I'd hurt, mm -hmm. um, but also b see the impermanence of of the event see the impermanence of the trauma. And as a, as a result, I was able to just let go of that, the, a lot of those emotions. So that was one of the, 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 the main lessons in those two days. The second one was um, 
you've got to start taking care of your Earth Rover, Martin. Mm, that's one <laughs> of call, my call, favorite call, terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, you hear that a lot in the book, right? So, and mm. I call I call my human body the Earth Rover, um, and because I need it to get around this uh, this place. And um, yeah, I was there. Was, there was so much loving instruction um, provided about how I must start taking care of my body. At the same time, of course, as, as having uh, ethereal surgery, I don't know if you've come across this concept. Hmm. Um, in so I, um, the ayahuasca space, and yeah, 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 in the psychedelic space. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of other people different having names. It. Yeah, well, uh, I think Terence McKenna called them machine elves, didn't he? Um, yeah. And, I, and I, I, I had that. I had the the whole. Um, it's very difficult to explain, isn't it? In in <laughs> using using these this body and this brain and in this density, mm. but essentially full on ethereal surgery on parts of my body that were severely injured. Um, I witnessed that and and felt so much love as a result of it. And the third. Mm. <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps more profound, if it could be any more profound, the third more profound experience was actually finding myself in a place of unity consciousness in a, in a mm. different density and being greeted by entities who uh, welcomed me back, mm. and which was interesting uh, because, of course, I had no memory of being there. But then uh, the more time we spent time, that's a, that's a funny idea, isn't it? Because there is right. no time or space in, in, when you're in this place. But, um, but the more time I spent interacting with these entities, the more I began to remember. So they're, they're stacking all of this information. You know, they're telling me all about quantum physics and life, love the universe, whatever, you know. Um, and then the more I start to laugh and, and they say, why are you laughing? I say, I know all of this, don't I? Yes. Yeah, you, of course you know it all. <laughs> you're from here. Wow. And there was this incredible revelation that, um, that what I thought, or rather who I thought I was, was nothing but an illusion. Um, mm. that the Martin story is just that it's, um, it's a projection. Um, and it's not my true self. And I, and so I suppose the profundity in it all was, I already theoretically knew this stuff because I'd already begun to research plant medicines before I did the work. And I'd, uh, I was already doing transcendental meditations and um, a little bit of breath work and that sort of thing. But there's a, there's a difference, isn't there? I think between uh, having faith in something intellectually knowing a thing and then actually experiencing it. Um, mm. And it's, it's neither belief nor faith. It just is. And so that yeah. was the, that was really the profundity of the experience. Yeah, it's kind of like you have those experiences and then you're so sure that that is much more real than this glass that I have in my hand now. Um, and right. you become aware that this glass is much more made up than what you get to experience in these other realms. Um, I'm reading a book by, by Andrew Gallimore called Reality Switch Technologies, and he really digs into how our bodies perceive information and interpret the world around us based on a series of binary code, really, that um, fire, mm. yes, no, fire, yes, no. And when we take these plant medicines and psychedelics, they shift how we receive that information. And so instead of living in a world full of like channel A, now all of a sudden our frequency opens up and we can see that there's a channel B and a channel C and you can tune into those and yeah. realize that um, this isn't the only only time and place or space. To totally. So it's, 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 we are immersed in, in all of the vibrations, aren't we, I think, when we're with the plant mm -hmm. medicine and, and you feel that those vibrations distinctly more uh, potently than than life here, and it sounds like a strange thing to say, doesn't it? But actually, actually, there's 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 a dullness to being uh, to being to existing in third density versus um, mm. versus experiences when you're with plant medicine. But of course, it's not just plant medicine. I, I write about um, this in the book. There was uh, Carl Jung had a, a very famous experience, a near death experience, where he had a heart attack. And he was in hospital in a kind of a coma for three weeks. Mm. 
And during that, uh, during that whole time, he, he had a prolonged near-death experience. And Carl Jung wrote about this in detail, which I, was, I, I detail in the book, so I won't ramble on about it. But he said exactly the same thing as you. He said there was a, a, there was a real sense that this was reality, this, this place of no time and no space. I'm paraphrasing because mm-hmm. that's a, a, a term I tend to use. But essentially, that was more real to him than being uh, back home on Earth. And, and actually, when he did return uh as as happy as i'm sure many people were that he was alive and and he was to an extent he was also a little bit sad to have returned mm. back to uh to third density although then of course after his near-death experience he created the archetypes individuation the synchronicity concept you know he he he, li- he put his near-death experience largely down to his best work because yeah. He suddenly became a, a spiritualized psychologist, I suppose, for want of a better word. Right. Yeah. Like how beautiful. <laughs> how beautiful to take those lessons in that space and then put them to use in this reality to help everyone change and transcend. And um, I love something else you touched on, which was the impermanence of your situation. And that's a word, um, mm. as I've been in my, my Buddhist course now, my planetary dharma, uh, for turning of the wheel teachings. Um we really addressed impermanence this past weekend and wow, to, to really truly feel that and embody that, you know, it kind of goes with the, the tagline of like, nothing stays the same. We're always changing. We're always evolving. Um, but Mm -hmm. when you really drop in and, and take a look around and even what you've created for yourself stands to crumble at any moment or stands to shift or pivot or Mm -hmm. become better or to diminish. Um, and so, embracing that and not getting too attached to the things like you know i I deeply desire to move somewhere else at some point uh, another country and well i've lived in like australia before and i travel a lot um i look at my home right now and i'm like i fucking love my home i love it i love it so much and then i'm like but remember you can create a new one and this is impermanent it's not real too it's just temporary (laughs) Yeah, it's a, it's a game changer. Uh, it, uh, the, the Buddhists call it a Nietzsche, and mm. um, call him perfect a Nietzsche. And it's the um, well, actually, the Buddha said, and and, and the, this is very much the central tenet of my book, of the How to Die Happy book, is the the invitation for people to to truly understand and therefore embrace change, the concept of change, because of course we're talking about dying, and we're talking about um, we're talking about finding and attaining everlasting happiness. And of course, you can only do that if you also understand that that, that happiness is also impermanent. Um, but, mm. in, but in truly understanding the impermanence of happiness, you can be happy. So there's a, there's a paradox uh, to get your head around. But um, as the Buddha said, the attachment is the root to all suffering. And understanding this was was an absolute game changer for me. I have to say it. Uh, I, I, I often say to people, if you had five minutes left to live, what would be on your list of regrets? Mm. And people will start to share some of these things or write a list. And again, the book invites readers to do just that at the beginning of the book, um, a, a kind of an unfiltered list of the things you would regret. You've only got five minutes left now. Um, and then the idea is to ultimately ask yourself so how do we change that how do how do we how do we uh create a paradigm shift so that you don't have any regrets because it's not mm-hmm. a case of just saying oh yeah i don't have any regrets i don't care that's not the point it's not about not caring because you do uh, it's about being able to see the impermanence in everything it's about being able to see the, the impermanence of an emotion or uh the eyes in my in my skull or this hand or or this body right or or this mm-hmm. or you know, this microphone, everything in this universe is subject to the law of impermanence. So, of mm-hmm. course, the challenge for us as humans is to to fully grasp that and then also ask ourselves, well, if we know intellectually that we're all subject to, to the laws of impermanence, then why are we so surprised when people die? Mm. Now... That might sound like a heartless thing to say, but of course you're you're you're, you're doing the the work of uh, the Buddhists now, and and so you will come across this time and time and time again, because the Buddhists, uh, I think, are, and I, I talk about Buddhism a lot in my book, though I'm not a Buddhist, but I I fully fully 
uh, embrace and resonate with uh, with a lot of the Buddhist teachings because I, I feel that um, that it's it's that that advice is is actual practical stuff for for living life on Earth. Um, if you take away you know, the, I think people's misconception that Buddhism is, is about dogma and doctrine. And of course, I think you say Buddhist to a lot of people and they think shaved heads and red and yellow <laughs> robe, right? Yeah. And that's just, that's not the point. I mean, actually, I, I got the message from uh, on, a, on a very um, deep psilocybin journey once that Buddhism isn't a religion. It's uh, a guide to interdimension. It's the guide to life on earth for, in, for an interdimensional traveler. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> so Changed everything. Right? Yeah, I mean, that totally it made so much sense to me. And I thought, wow, fuck yeah, okay. That actually makes so much sense. And so then I started to look at Buddhism through that lens. Actually, mm. it's, a, it's a handbook for interdimensional travelers having a samsaric experience. Um, wow. So you look at the, you know, the ideas that, uh, uh, of Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. Uh, we won't talk about Anatta necessarily, but right now, Dukkha is suffering, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the Gautama Buddha was all about suffering. That guy was the, 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 the authority on suffering, no doubt about it. Sorry, my dog's banging into the table. Oh, I'm just going to let my Mine's dog always out. always running around as well. I've got, I've got two in here, so they're both Aww. quite needy. Um, yeah. So yeah, Gautama Buddha was the was the the guru on suffering, um, but and he was very very keen to point out at, at all turns that we suffer because we are attached to things. Mm-hmm. So if we can cease to be attached to anything and everything, then we will cease to suffer. That's not to say lose your connection. It's not to mm-hmm. say we lose our care about it. But through these experiences that I've had over the last few years in my work with plant medicine, I can. I can genuinely say without a shadow of a doubt that I, I no longer fear death. That if you told me I had five minutes left to live, I would, I would get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I'd give you a big hug and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd thank everybody around me and I'd go and meditate under a tree um, and, and express my gratitude for, for what a, the, an, an incredible wild ride uh, that I've had. Because um, I have. It's been absolutely amazing. And I'm not dead yet, but you know, the point is it might be tomorrow, right? Mm, yeah. So it's the idea of, of really understanding um, uh, the impermanence of everything that can absolutely flip the script on our on our perception of happiness. Mm-hmm. And I like that concept around no longer fearing death. Um, it's something that I I don't fear as well, and I wonder if that stems from like a life si- a lifetime of suicidal thoughts. Um, I first wanted to commit suicide when I was eight years old which is um, mm. a very interestingly early time for someone to want to have to feel that way. Um, and it yeah. was over petty things, but I mean, as an eight year old, the, the most important things you have in life are like homework and family. And I didn't want to do the homework and I thought killing myself would be a great way out. Um, so my parents were not thrilled I mean, to. You wouldn't have to do your homework if you'd kill yourself. <laughs> that's for sure. But, yeah. Man. Parents were not thrilled to find me walking around the um, top story of our house on the outside of the railing, contemplating jumping down. And again, um, uh, my cat probably saved my life that that day. And um, angels in fur coats, these animals, aren't they? Oh, I love that terminology. Yes, yes. And so, you know, to to keep reflecting on your book a little bit, what I love is that you you do a phenomenal job of intermixing really practical tools that don't involve plant medicines and psychedelics, as well as interweaving that, that depth of the experience that you had. And I think, um, I would, I'd like to know sort of what you think the most powerful tool is that someone can use, um, to begin to gain more grounding in their existence. If they're really off the rocker, what can they do? right now that will have the biggest impact? That's a great question. Well, I suppose what I've, what I've ended up doing as a result of doing this work is, is, is in inventing a new field of study and and Mm -hmm. I'm playfully calling it psycho spiridelics. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll take off, but 
I'm sure you know, people people will immediately get where where this is going. And so so my experience of of working out how to feel better about being here on Earth was was establishing a, a combined practice between understanding applied psychology, spirituality, and the uh, integrated use of psychedelics into that into that space. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that uh, that you can only achieve happiness if you work with psychedelics. Far from it, and I and I make this point several times in the book. You can you can do it faster. Although I obviously recommend that's done. You don't do it alone, and it's done responsibly for yeah. sure. Um, I always say psychedelics are like a, a laser cut key um, to to some of this stuff, as opposed to five years in therapy, for example. But what I discovered through doing this work actually was that the, uh, no surprise here, but the ancient yogis, the mystics and the masters, they already had it sussed. And that's mm. part of the part, you know, part of the point of this book is to say, look, I'm not, okay, so I've invented a field of study. It's called psychospiridelics, hardy ha. <laughs> um, but actually, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. This book is, is as much as anything, it, uh, it's about curated ancient wisdom. And the mystics and the, and the yogis have, have had it nailed uh, ever since humanity began. And it begins with breath. It's, mm -hmm. And actually, when you look at all of the practices and the modalities that we have available to us, doesn't matter where the, the master is in the world, doesn't matter which era uh, they from which they come, breath is always at the center of all of those practices. It's the, it's the one common theme. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my... My first uh, practical utility for any, anyone is to really understand the importance of breath, to check in with it. Um, I talk about meditation a lot in the book as well, but I'm very keen to point out that I think there's so much confusion for, for people who perhaps suffer with anxiety or stress or depression. There's a lot of confusion around what meditation is. And I think because there are so many different modalities of, of meditation, there's a lot of uh, anxiety around it. You know, people are anxious that they're not able to meditate and, they, and then they get frustrated. I can't meditate. Why can't you meditate? What's, what do you mean? I can't. I'm trying to meditate and I can't do it. Of course, yeah. you know, obviously for anyone who meditates, we, we, we know it's kind of funny because um, you're not supposed to try. There's nothing, there, is, there is nothing to do. There is no thing to do with meditate. That's the, meditation. That's the whole point. So I would say breath, but, but more fundamentally, and I'm very keen to talk about this to anyone who will listen, because we now have the internet um, working at, uh, at hyperspeed, providing all of this knowledge for us all, incredible knowledge for us all to use and share and work with, um, there is now. There are now more opportunities. Keep dog. There are now more opportunities than ever for us to um, to to get involved in spiritual bypassing, as Wellwood called it. Who was a Buddhist uh, psychiatrist, uh, mm -hmm. psychologist, um, and spiritual bypassing is is that whole process where we where we don't do the shadow work. We skip the shadow work and we dive into breath work, yoga, psychedelics, um, you know, sound healing. You name it. Mm -hmm. and, and we never do that shadow work. So actually, one of my number one pieces of advice to anyone is you've got to do the shadow work. You've got to sit in the searing pain of all the shit you caused and did. Uh, you've got to go through that. You've got to hold, you, not hold on to it. It's not the point, but you've got, to, you've got to take yourself back to all of those times and you've got to learn how to process it. As uh, mm -hmm. Ryan Holiday uh, would say uh, the obstacle is the way, yes. which of course is derived from the, the the old Taoist saying, the obstacle is the path. So the point is we shouldn't be trying to get over something. We've got to go through it. We've got to go through these things rather than uh, suppress or repress them. Absolutely. Anyway, it was a long answer to your question, but hopefully <laughs> it was helpful. Well, I just love hearing you talk anyway, so you just have at it. <laughs> Um, Thank goodness. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I think I you're like absolutely, absolutely right. Like the obstacle is the way. And I, um, for me, I feel like I stumbled through so much of that by myself on psychedelics where, you know, I got in therapy for the first time at eight years old for wanting to kill myself and had a lot of um, self-reflective questions asked to me throughout my life. But 
then once I dove in with the psychedelics, I already had kind of that background of how to dive into my problems. And so doing that paired with the psychedelics was incredibly powerful, but I'm also willing to extremely acknowledge that that comes from years of already doing some self-development work and using Mm. psychedelics then as the tool to help me do that more effectively and integrating that experience afterwards, which is what I think makes having a facilitator for these experiences so powerful to, especially anyone who's not feeling overly equipped to be their own psychotherapist. Um, Mm. Yeah, it's really. Yeah, that's so important. Well, and of course, one of the things, uh, uh, something we all do when we're mentally ill is we therapize ourselves. Mm. Um, and and the, more, the more closed our heart due to our trauma, uh, the worse that can be, right? So uh, because we, we tend not to trust anyone and we also don't want to share any of this stuff because for whatever reason, for, for whatever happened to us and likely in our early childhood years, there's a lot of shame attached to it. Mm-hmm. So w- we build up these walls. I, I, I always talk about, I don't know if anybody's seen the Lord of the Rings movies, but you know those big castles, inside castles, inside castles, you know, with a mountain protecting it. Now, mm-hmm. I, I always talk about my... Yeah my former emotional state like that, except mine also had a moat uh, around it with <laughs> sharks swimming around and they had lasers on the top of them, you know, and there was CCTV and alligators with flick knives, you know, the whole shebang. So nobody was getting anywhere near my, um, my fragile heart that was, that was locked in the, in the castle's keep. And, mm. and that, I'm not unique. We're, there are so many of us in that state. And I think um, as a result of that, the, the, there comes a point where we might be our, we might actually be our only therapist. We might be the only person to whom we seek for care and advice. And of course, perhaps stating the obvious, a mentally ill person ought not to be taking advice from themselves. Yes. <laughs> um, but I did for so many years and it took me a long time to realize that it was poor advice. <laughs> <laughs> consistently delivered poor advice but mm. uh you know some of us have to learn the hard way mm. uh, that's just the way we are right <laughs> yeah and so you had a, a big um alcohol problem and uh addiction as well drugs i believe a little bit were a little yeah. of your and yeah. so how do you feel now doing psychedelics having had that background like what for you makes that what you're doing now acceptable okay um that's a great question well yeah so my 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 main malfunctions were alcohol cocaine and sex Mm -hmm. um but in reality uh if you if you gave me a bag of weed i would i would chain smoke that as well (laughs) um now there's a there's a great debate being had, and it's again it's being it's being had right now because of course every every time we look in in the news, um, I hasten to add the conscious news. I'm I'm not mm. one for uh, for the mainstream media, but uh, we, we see another American state or city is decriminalizing or at least shifting the uh, the legalities around the the use or or prescription of psychedelic medicines, which is, of course, is awesome, right? Yeah. So already we're seeing we're seeing some leveling up uh, of, of a counter argument where people are starting to complain about um, about the dangers of psychedelics. More often than not, these are people who have zero experience or understanding of, of these medicines. Uh, but that's always the case, right? Um, the point I'm uh, rambling towards is that it's about terminology. So people call, some people call psychedelics drugs. Mm -hmm. I and you through this conversation so far have referred to them as medicines. Mm -hmm. Distinct, distinct difference. Uh, Now, when you add that to the fact that there is is no um, addictive compound in the majority of these medicines, it's not an addictive experience, then hopefully people who have very little understanding of this can begin to grasp that a former, and I say former, I'm, I'm, I'm not a 12 steps, um, I'm not from the 12 steps program. Psych- psychedelics fix my addiction for good, like mm. indefinitely, it's done. I'll, I'll never use again. 
I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it never even crosses my mind. That's how potent these medicines can be when applied properly to it, to addiction treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course people in, uh, in the 12 steps and I'm not disrespecting the 12 steps process or anybody in the 12 steps. I know a, a number of people in the 12 steps, um, uh, program who are, who have been sober or, 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 um, or off drugs for 25 years, you know, but they still refer to themselves as recovering. And, um, the, and that's language that that's part of this whole setup. These medicines, they just, they, they absolutely eradicate addiction and, uh, and, and they, there's nothing addictive about them at all. I mean, as you likely know, I mean, you could do, you could do an ayahuasca ceremony and then say, right, that's me done for a year. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't need it anymore. Uh, you could do the same with psilocybin, smoking DMT, uh, Bufo, uh, five MAO DMT that is, um, uh, or mescaline, you know, that they're, they're not experiences that you necessarily want to get involved with again. Now there are people who do, who are addicted, who are dealing with, um, deep seated problems, but not dealing with them who will continually return to psychedelics because they check out. So they're actually using them to escape reality as opposed mm. to, uh, as opposed to actually doing that deep healing, but it's a rare, it's a rarity. And I, and I think, I think most of the people listening to this show will probably agree. It's a rare thing in the community. There's nothing addictive about them and they're not drugs. So I have had criticism, uh, talking about this from people in the 12 steps program saying, well, you're not sober then are you? Well, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent sober, um, because I didn't deal with the symptoms. The medicine tackled the traumatic route, yes. uh, and it helped me to understand and observe with all the love in the universe, the, um, the context of those traumatic events. And as a result, I was able to forgive myself and others around me and uh and and move on with a with an open heart and mind mm. so you know obviously they're always they're always going to be contrasting truths aren't they yeah that's one of the one of the cool things about living in a in a realm of duality but uh yeah i mean for me there can be no debate well there is a debate but there can be no debate in my experience about the, the healing property of these medicines oh, i couldn't agree more um you know i've also struggled with alcohol uh, I personally had three DUIs throughout my lifetime. And, um, the third one I thought for sure was going to be the end of the end for me. Um, but then I would sort of draw upon this, this idea that, you know, people got out of jail and turned their lives around all the time. I thought it was going to be a felony when I got arrested. Um, it turned out mm -hmm. it was not a felony. I don't know when that law changed, which, um, I'm grateful it did, but, um, having gone through the 18 month DUI program twice, um, it's like no fun. And to remember some of the staff, same place, you know, they're like, Oh, sorry to see you here again. He's back. Yeah. yeah. And, um, Pardon the pump, that, but I imagine that's a very sobering experience. Oh, for sure. I mean, to, to count, I've been to jail three, four, five times in my life. Hmm. Um, which, you know, you would never, never know by, looking at me. I mean, I've even been this last DUI, I was sentenced to 129 days in jail. And I Wowzers. thank goodness to Los Angeles County jails for being wildly overpopulated. Um, and for um, my particular misdemeanor offense, um, it was, I only spent two days in jail and time served, but um, could, could have been wildly different, nice. even just in another county in the state. And um, I too can also reflect on the fucked up shit I did because of alcohol and the pain that caused me to, to do that. I mean, I would just get blackout drunk all the time, all the time. Um, to to mm. say I've been blackout drunk over a hundred times feels like an understatement to me. Um, mm. You know, I, I woke up one time in the grass of a church to two firemen standing over me in, in downtown Orlando, like in the, the hood part of Orlando. And I had wandered away from where the bars were trying to find my car, but wandered in the wrong direction. And somehow my phone was dead. So I couldn't GPS my location. And so I decided to sleep in the bushes in the, in the hood. 
and these firemen found me and they were like, you can't be out here. Like you're about, this is, this is how your life goes horribly wrong. And bless their well, at least you got rescued by two firemen. It's kind of a yeah. fantasy at the same time, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, kind of. But guess who wants nothing to do with the girl that they found in the bushes? Two firemen. Yeah, good point. <laughs> you know? uh, so they, in, you know, yeah, they, they put me in a taxi and sent me home, uh, courtesy of the Orlando Fire Department, which I was incredibly grateful for. And um, But that's mm. just one of so many fucked up experiences. And that's that's mild compared to some of the other things I've endured and suffered through because of alcohol and also doing the work on plant medicines went in and healed those traumas. And what I think happens with alcohol too, is now you have such a resentment for yourself for those situations. You have such Mm -hmm. deep embarrassment and like, you know, I had to sit with every single one of those experiences and forgive myself, forgive myself Mm. for the way that it made me feel to have have woken up realizing I could have very well been raped and murdered in the part of town I was in and um, to forgive myself for getting in that situation. And plant medicines had a really powerful impact on allowing for that forgiveness, allowing for that heart opening. And like you said, healing that underlying depression, that underlying sadness by tapping me into the things that I always knew were around us, but that my parents tried to tell me weren't. And I was listening Mm. to that social programming of um, what you see is what you get. And we live in a box and through the plant medicines was able to tap into like, no, I was right all along. There's other dimensions here. There's energy everywhere. There's, I can control it. You can control it. And there's more Mm. than just this, this little reality we see in front of us. The matrix. Yeah. Take the, take the yeah, red I, pill. I, yeah. I, I was thinking about, I was reflecting, um, about the counterculture movement in the sixties, mm. you know, Ram Dass, Tim Leary, um, Alan Watts, uh, to name, but a few, all of these guys, uh, who were many of which of course were working with LSD in the first place. Um, and, and, and saying all of these wild things at the time, which, which then made them, on the one hand, very popular and, and on the other, immensely unpopular, didn't they? I think uh, Nixon said that Tim Leary was the most dangerous man in America at one point, mm. uh, despite him being a Harvard graduate uh, uh, professor in psychiatry mm. alongside Ram Dass, who was Dick Albert, Albert at the time. But these guys, I found a lot of wisdom in, in what these guys had to say about you know life in the matrix and and this whole alternative perspective i think we we all go on different journeys don't we pardon the pun when we work with psychedelics i think i think it, it opens different avenues for diff, for for all of us and then and then we go off and start learning more at least that's my experience looking around the community of people i know who have once they've worked with plant medicines you know, it's like, wow, the world is my oyster and actually beyond is my oyster. So I'm, I want to learn lots. I, I, you know, I'm now open to all of this stuff. What I, what, what don't I know? And of course that everyone mm. realizes they don't know anything and they're happy about that. Um, but I was, I was thinking about how those people, those men in particular were pioneers and the amount of, um, p- social pressure and hatred and aggression and mm. vilification that they had to deal with back in the 60s you know um but what pioneers they were to 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 pave the way for this renaissance that's happening now yeah i'm so glad to be a part of what's happening now i mean you know in the the 60s it was so tumultuous and riddled with um the war and um just a a much more challenging time for the medicines (sighs) so i'm curious You sort of mentioned um, when you were in the medicine space that you discovered that you weren't from here, from Earth. You know that you were this interdimensional traveler. Do you do you have any idea where you are from? No, that's never it's never been revealed to me. And, and uh, I, interestingly, I talk to obviously I sit in ceremony all the time with people, um, and I facilitate as well. I, I serve uh, happy mm. in uh, medicine ceremonies, so a lot of people will 
tell me their experiences. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I've discovered that I've been here and I'm from here and yada, yada. And of course, lots of people will have many past, the, the detailed past life experiences. But my, my medicine journeys have never been like that. They've been, uh, they've been detail enough to say you were a Viking, for example. Cool. I was a Viking, quite a fierce, quite a fierce one. I've seen, yeah. I've seen that face. There's big scars and stuff um, uh, with the with the psilocybin journeys, but I've never had that had had that level of detail. And I suspect it's because I, on one hand, I realise there's, there's, it's not really necessary. You know, mm. it's it's just more. There's, we can be we can become attached to that, can't we? I think so. Uh, just as we can, we are attached to our story now. We can be we we can become quite um, um, entranced by the idea of all of our past life stories. And and I know many people who can account who can recount all of their you know well several of their past past life stories and the details of it. But if we're not careful, we can become attached to that as well. So perhaps that's a reason why I never got that information. Um, mm. But there, there was a there was a time psilocybin journey again, actually, where I I found myself in um, in a space I was kind of unfamiliar with, and I was I was faced with um, an energetic entity, for want of a better word, which was vast and just it was just creating fractals all around it and inside mm. it. It was this fractal entity. And it explained to me that I was a projection of it. Um, and it kind of showed me this, you know, sort of like almost, you know, puppet arrangement, but not puppet because obviously the, the, there's no control in that, in that regard. Um, but it, it, it very clearly presented this idea that, uh, that I was an expression of it. Um, mm. And I wasn't the only expression of it in this game, in the third density game. Uh, but I never got around to asking, you know, its name or where it was from. <laughs> Probably such concepts don't exist, right? <laughs> uh, they do. They do, though. And um, that's one of the things that I do on ayahuasca is explore the DMT realms and meet with different alien races. And um, I had this experience. You get the names. Uh, I suppose maybe you're right. They don't have names. I'm starting to learn to identify <laughs> them. <laughs> I've yeah, you'll, this, yeah. Well, that's the difference. Yeah, you this, recognize their energy. So. This cool little butterfly species. Um, they're they're kind of shaped like aviator sunglasses. Um, if you were to give them a two dimensional shape, and they come and they flutter in yep. my peripherals, and they don't they don't really do much communicating, but they beam love and light, and so they just come and kind of sprinkle happiness and and joy. Or I had this other one come to me that. Um, communicated in these electric zaps and they were electrically oh, yeah. zapping my tongue. And so they were yep. trying to teach me how to tap into this technology in my tongue. <laughs> you know, sometimes these things are happening and you're like, what are you like, could you be more clear? What, what's what happening? Yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. And because like they're not speaking English, they're generally speaking in like sort of a telepathy download, at least for me, um, but, you know, sometimes mm. the message is so unclear, but they, they really enjoy playing with me and I enjoy playing with most of them. Nice. I, my, mm. I've had a lot of interactions with the praying mantis, uh, species, if you, if you like, um, that's cool. been a thing. Um, and actually I was, I was, I did, a, I was doing some work with Wachuma and Changa in a, in an mm. Inca temple in the Cusco Hills in Peru. Sick. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, pretty, yeah, as you do on a Saturday. Um, I and so. I'd, uh, I, I talk about being blinded in the book, this, this um, chap, um, very angry man, viciously sucker punched me um, a few years back and blinded me. And I, so mm -hmm. I had to have a couple of surgeries in my eyeball. I was in a lot of pain and I was in a lot of pain still while I was in the Cusco Hills doing, doing the work with this medicine and this, um, pray mantis sort of appears and suddenly starts going pew, pew, same sort of thing, like mm. zapping me with these, um, you know, like these beams choo, 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 into the eye and I'm going, yeah. Whoa, Whoa. Hey, Hey, my space, hang on, back up. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure if I like this. That's my eye. Mm. And the, and the entity says, I know. And I'm like, pew, 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 
And, he's, and I'm like, well, could, could you just possibly explain what it is you're doing? I'm healing it. Ah, oh, all mm. right. Cool, man. Carry on. <laughs> and I just sat there and meditated. <laughs> well, this praying mantis zapped me with these 3D uh, beams. And, you know, you can take this uh, or leave it as the truth, but, uh, but shortly thereafter, the pain disappeared in my eyeball. Mm. And how was your vision? So, uh, well, my, I, I, they'd already put a plastic lens in, okay. in my, over my cornea, um, but my vision has actually improved. So um, I don't know, you know, obviously you, you speak to a traditional Western de- doctor and they would say, yeah, well, it's, you know, it could take years to heal, but then it gets better and yada, yada, you know, and I, 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 I respect that truth. Um, but my truth is that, uh, that my, my eyesight and, and the pain all completely improved significantly as a result of doing that work i had done a i'd done a 10-day ayahuasca and wachuma retreat uh, prior to that as well um and then ended up going down to the um amazon basin in brazil to hang out with the noki queen tribe um mm. also known as the katukina that's they're a fascinating bunch they're uh, ayahuasca and cambo masters oh. um yeah, very cool, very cool people. So uh, I've, I've got a friendship with the guys down there now, and, and we, you know, we still we're, we're talking about doing some stuff together. Hopefully, be working on a documentary together this year. Oh, very cool! So big up the Nokikwin tribe. Yeah, well, and I feel like your story is um, one that's shared so much across, especially ayahuasca participants, of this sort of magical healing that takes place. And I see it all the time now in my ceremonies down in Peru with Hamilton Souther at Blue Morpho. Um, people come, and and one of my friends, uh, Chris, shout out to Chris, he had some um, neck trauma, and these aliens came and showed him in this this last time I was there how to um, sort of fix his neck and walked him through Mm. these different stretches and things that he could do to alleviate his own pain. And we're kind of doing some of it for him as well. And and he was a little freaked out in the beginning. (laughs) Like these aliens are doing shit to me. Like what the fuck? (laughs) What the fuck is happening to me? Yeah. But he made, (laughs) he made homies with them. And so then he's like just thriving in it. They're like showing him hand motions and things to channel his energy. And he was like, (laughs) <laughs> you know, a guy from, uh, I think he's from New York. Don't, don't hurt me if I get this wrong, but New York. And, uh, he's just like, yo, like, you know, if you could hear a little bit of a New York accent in it, like, yo, they were showing me these energy things and I was learning to channel my own energy lines and, um, yeah, just like a yeah, really it's, deep healing. It's, you know, it's, that's a common phenomenon, isn't it? it, it mm-hmm. Different flavors, different shapes, but a common phenomenon is that people, Working with um, ayahuasca, especially, I think, um, but also Wachuma, um, San Pedro cactus, find themselves doing things that they didn't know they could do. And I, I remember, so that the first, that, that Moroccan weekend, I, on the first Wachuma ceremony, later on through the ceremony, I was, um, I was sitting doing, um, you know, mudras mm-hmm. and doing all of these things with my hands. And, and I had no, and then I started to do yoga. And at that time I'd, ve- I'd done very little yoga. And I remember saying to, uh, to one of the guys who was, who'd introduced me to the medicine, who was, you know, pretty, pretty an expert practitioner. Uh, I said, well, what's that all about? I'm, I'm doing these things and I'm, I, I was doing yoga. I don't know yoga. And he just said, you may not know yoga, but yoga knows you, oh, which I thought yeah. was a, beautiful way to put it that uh actually again we are remembering you know we're remembering mm. these things we're either being an entity is is likely re-showing it to us or through the the removal of the veil we're remembering uh, these things in a past life and and i think ultimately you know the the things that we don't know uh the the ancient civilizations like the inca and the mayans were practicing and the, and the egyptians you know that mm-hmm. we have zero idea of, of what these people were doing with energy with sound with light um but what we do know is that they were absolutely uh, they had the power to to heal themselves in an entirely different way mm-hmm. and that that um science has been completely re- eradicated uh, and of course is now referred to by the um the scientific community as pseudoscience um 
you know we're in a we're in an interesting space aren't we where where we we just have to I, I suppose as practitioners just be patient continue to do the work tell these stories um be the change you mm -hmm. know um and then hopefully people around us are going to say okay that's interesting what's happened to you because you were you know a self-sabotaging narcissistic asshole um <laughs> who drank a lot and there's something different about you so you know, i'm interested in that story and, that, and that's been happening to me recently that people from my past have, have been reaching out and saying okay i'm i'm genuinely interested in what you've done <laughs> what i want what what's in your tea <laughs> you know <laughs> well i'm not sure if you want what's in my tea because it's really thick and brown <laughs> tastes like ayahuasca, ayahuasca. <laughs> but um, it tastes nasty, but uh, but I, I it's you know we're in that sort of space now, aren't we? Where where these worlds are colliding, and this is where this my idea of psycho spiridelics really comes into play. That I've been talking for a while with the podcast now that um, that the, the that that vacuous gap between science and spirituality is slowly merging together, and whilst the main a lot of mainstream science is unwilling to accept that because of course you know it breaks a lot of rules and, ch and, and presumably messes with a lot of people's um uh, published concepts but as that as that as that um bridge is created and, and the institute of noetic science has been talking about this for years right um we're going to have we're going to see so many incredible evolutionary discoveries in uh, in the world of science and you look mm -hmm. at things like cymatics and um you know, uh, like what uh, what's his name, Robert Grant's doing to, with with uh, his study of um, of ancient e Egypt and, and sacred geometry. Mm. There's, there is there's so much knowledge that's being unearthed and and uh, and and investigated now, but it's it's very complex to us because we we have a you know, we have this limited understanding of, of of what existence is, which has been told to us over over hundreds of years, right? And yeah. it's all being, it's all about to change. Yeah. And I love that even major universities all around the world are starting to pop up with departments diving into consciousness or psychedelics or spirituality, like yeah. a, and UCLA yeah. here in California has a, a consciousness department. Um, you know, we're talking about Beautiful. Harvard, we're talking about, um, yeah, all sorts of brilliant universities. And so I think you're absolutely right. I want to work in the consciousness. Department. Right, I know. It was, uh, they're even That's offering epic. degrees now in human consciousness and spirituality. And I was like, should I get a master's? I was like, you hate school, don't do it. But <laughs> yeah, in there, I've been there. I, but you know, that's an interesting thing. You, you, I was thinking about this uh, when writing the book. I started to, I started to, because one of the things the book does is is constantly provide practical utilities, right, mm -hmm. for the art of living. That's the point. Of so I start to unearth things like um, Eric Burns transactional analysis, Stephen Cartman's drama triangle, mm -hmm. um, some the, the Jungian twelve archetypes, and and then and then and, and represent them to, to 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 point out how applicable they are to, to to living today. But did anybody teach us that at school? No mm -hmm. way. Was psychology? I don't even think when I was when I went to school, psychology wasn't even a course you could choose. Really? Yeah. Isn't it crazy? We, we, as far as I'm concerned now with the, with the life experience I have, psychology should be a, an absolute baked in uh, um, course in the syllabus from, from, as young, from, the, from the youngest age that you can possibly conceive uh, what it is you're being taught. That alongside mindfulness. And I, I, I mm. appreciate that she's a lot of uh, schools and syllabus um, in different countries and now starting to teach mindfulness to kids, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, but beggars belief, doesn't it, that we've uh, we weren't taught the, these things at school? How to interact, how to understand our own minds. Totally. You know? One it's of insane. my favorite courses in college was um, interpersonal communication, and I was lucky to go to a, a school that was a liberal arts school, so we we had a few more courses and things focused on personal development. Um, but I I took this uh, interpersonal communication class. And it really gave me so many of the tools that I continue to use today, such as how to um, how to listen, how to really deeply listen to someone, how to you know show up with 
stopping your own mind and paying attention first and responding second, um, how to approach someone in a way that's not attacking, how to reframe your, how to get away from why questions and ask more hows and whats and wheres and because the why tends to come off so much as attacking and immediately puts someone on the defense like why did you go to the store mm-hmm. today like uh, uh, now i have to prove to you why i went to the store as opposed to what was it that you needed at the store today and then it's like oh well yeah. let me tell you all about my shopping list um the responses are entirely different. And as I got into journalism mm-hmm. and things over time became also a powerful tool because you get better, better answers from people. But mm. yeah, I would wish that course. Yeah. Everyone. It's the power of language, isn't it? The power, the power of language, which I, I think so many of us overlook. And, and I, I wonder where we're going to be in five, 10 years, um, mm. in terms of our communicate, in terms of our communication skills, because of the fact that, you know, we now have these things ruling our lives, um, and, and thoughts and messages, uh, are, are so disposable and also fired from the hip, you know, pew, pew, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, right, boom, I'm going to send you a message. And then, and then more often than not, Oh, I wish I hadn't sent that message to the point where, Platforms like Telegram have an an unsend functionality, you know, because they know full and Instagram because they know full well that you actually you are gonna want to do that. And so I, I I I'm often talking about how words are spells, mm-hmm. and uh, we ought to be and they are spell. It's called spelling for a reason, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and we ought to be more considerate of of their use. Uh, I always I like to talk about Rumi, Rumi's utility here and that is Rumi's three gates I don't know if you're familiar with Rumi's three gates I'm not but please enlighten me well Rumi is as most people will know so I won't teach grandma how to suck eggs here but Rumi was a 12th century 12th century I think he was 12th century don't quote me on that um Sufi mystic and poet and very incredible wise man incredibly wise man and wrote some profound stuff and he had he had this idea about before you think or utter a word, send it through three gates. Mm. The first gate, is it true? Mm. The second gate, is it necessary? And the third gate, is it kind? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I learned that, it absolutely it was a game changer. So, so simple, but an absolute game changer. Wait. Uh, you know, you literally just stop yourself. I'm about to say something. Is that true, kind, necessary? No. It might be one. Does that count? No, you, you can't get away with one out of three. Really, you shouldn't even be getting away with two out of three. So, mm. uh, and it, it took me a while, but but that's a, a great utility to you for anyone to use. Really simple. Of course, it, the, the first issue is working out how to do it with the spoken word. But then, as you practice, and of course, the more work you do with you, with your own presence, then you can start doing it with your thoughts. And that's mm. where you you know you stop yourself thinking something. And I find myself going kudos <laughs> thanks martin <laughs> no you won't. um so yeah, yeah. All right, try that at home kids for sure and actually now that you explain it i have heard that before and it is a bit of a challenging thing to implement um but it reminds me of a, a practice i put into play of beginning to say kind things instead of negative things about people and um, experiences and catching myself in saying something derogatory or uh, unkind and immediately flipping it. Um, You know, so for instance, if I saw someone overweight at the ice cream shop buying like a triple, triple scoop cone and being like, wow, that person uh, clearly loves ice cream. And then being like, oh, Barrett, you're being a bitch. Let's, uh, let's flip yeah. that. And now you have to say something kind about that girl. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I, I really honor that she gets to have the food that she desires right now. And in that sense, I think I said that because I was jealous that I don't get to have the ice cream mm. or I'm not going to have the ice cream. And, um, she has really pretty hair and, uh, yeah, I wish her well, but it's, it's also revolutionized things like <laughs> how I sit in traffic, um, you know, people get such road rage and especially mm-hmm. driving around the greater Los Angeles area, traffic's fucking gnarly. And, um, I was just driving in so much of it yesterday and 
I had sort of my meditation music on. So it'd be like Tibetan singing bowls in the background while I'm driving and watching people cut me off left. I'm like, didn't they notice that was a right turn only? And they went straight and now they want to be in front of me. Like, ah, send them kindness, send them love. And so I'm, I'm feel like the only person driving through the streets, but as soon as someone cuts me off, I'm like, Oh gosh, they must have such an emergency. I honor their urgency <laughs> and I send them love and light. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, we all do that, don't we? It's, it's, um, I, I personally, I, I think the, the biggest challenge we have on in uh, at earth school is uh is that whole judgment piece you know because mm -hmm. ultimately we are in a realm of duality and even though we do all of this work to to constantly see our connection and to see the illusion of separation ultimately when you're having a super zen drive up the road up the street and somebody cuts you up <laughs> there is that immediate right you mother you know <laughs> and it's uh it's, it's it's a thing it's a i've been working on the the judgment thing for a couple of years now, um, intensely. Hmm. And I, th I've, I've come to the, I've come to the conclusion that the moment I entirely cease to judge anybody and everybody, I'll probably just disappear into a, into a rainbow light. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wholly possible in, on, in, in this uh, realm. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. point of it, isn't it? That's the point of samsara. Is it, it's a construct, and and part of that construct is dualism. Because, of course, if we saw our connection so intrinsically, uh, then there'd, there'd be no point in coming to Earth School in the first place. Right. So, but yeah, I, I, I hear you. It's something I it's something I'm constantly trying to do. I, I, I whenever I find myself thinking about somebody, observing them and thinking about them, the first thing I do is say, why, why are you judging that person? You're about to mm. judge that person. You're about to say something which is essentially judgment. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and a, 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 little, a little utility I have for that is most of the time when I find myself about to judge someone, I, I just take a look at myself and say, have you ever done that? Mm-hmm. And of course the answer is yes. Actually, I, I probably did it all 10 times um worse as well so hmm. actually i'm the last person and of course jeshua said this didn't he when he when he made his uh when he used his metaphor about um throwing stones you know hmm. you you can't possibly uh judge anybody if, you, if you've done that stuff yourself but that's uh, not to say that you then judge yourself for judging because of course that's the thing isn't it <laughs> oh right I'm, I'm so annoyed with myself for being judgmental ah you are being judgmental oh no <laughs> <laughs> fractal fractal mm. concerns here but i think it's just catching yourself doing anything like that if you if you're able then to say actually i did that yeah okay and then you suddenly went for me anyway when i then look back at that person again and and exactly what you just said what's what's happening in their day mm. uh to make them do that what actually what happened what's happened in their life mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't remember where i came across this idea but somebody once wrote about the idea that when every time we meet a person try and imagine them as an iceberg and, mm. and all we see is that tip above the above the water but actually all you know you've got miles not miles but you know many 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 meters deep of of something a backstory what's the mm. backstory actually you know because then suddenly someone ceases to become an argumentative dick and actually you can see that the, there's a wounded child or mm. actually they were a victim of, of abuse right. um you know so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's it's a constant trip isn't it, it life is. at earth school and i love that idea of giving someone compassion giving them grace honoring that they're just existing in the the what is right now as opposed to any sort of duality of right or wrong in their behavior um but they just simply are and to love them as such, but I think that also stems from being able to love yourself as such in your present moment yeah. and how you are and getting rid of that duality of having to be right or wrong or your behaviors are right or wrong, but accepting that it's shades of gray and without the dark, we can't have mm -hmm. the light and both are right. beautiful and both bring really yeah. important lessons 
Um, and so, you know, I've learned the most about myself in the depths of the darkness. And now I get to walk much more in the light, but it's not to say I don't still play in the darkness from time to time. I'm just coming out of a dark period mm. myself. And, um, but I'm learning from it and having that yeah. compassion and that grace for myself. And once you can do it for yourself, it's much, much more easy to apply it to everyone around you. But but I think that's um, and that's be- that's beautiful. I, I, actually, learning that and, and putting that into practice is, a, a, in my experience, a significant um, component to to have to living a happier life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and it's back to the shadow self. It's back to it's back to doing the shadow work. To to and and you you said it beautifully. How can you know the light if you haven't first known the darkness? So and and once we realize that w- we couldn't we couldn't know what light looked and felt like if we didn't know darkness you know right. just like i couldn't know this was left if i didn't know this was right mm. that's that is polarity um so in that in 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 doing that shadow work and fully appreciating who we have been but then forgiving ourselves and getting over it i think that that that's that's what opens up this this understanding of our intrinsic connection to everyone else because then we see ourselves in others and others in ourselves and of course this is what uh this is where ramdas's wonderful wisdom about um what did he say he said something that again i'm paraphrasing but uh, all i can do to help you is work on myself mm-hmm. and all you can do to help me is work on yourself mm-hmm. and Wow, I mean, I you know, just think about that for a moment. How profound that actually is, and it the, the, there's an expression, isn't it? Be the change you want to see in the world, which often I think is is labelled as a cliche, though I, I I don't believe it is. I I think it's uh, it's exactly the same message. And the message is, if I fundamentally understand how this Earth rover works, how this um, neurosis addled uh, psyche works. And then I get to improve upon that and I, and, and I forgive it and I love it, then surely that puts me in, in a good position to then uh, be better at interacting with more Earth Rovers with neuroses adult uh, psyches uh, and do it with a little bit more love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And what a beautiful message to, and description, depiction of... Um, understanding yes because we do each have our own neuroses um for a while i was uh, i sat in a borderline personality disorder diagnosis and while i would presume that clinically that is still a diagnosis that one would um have ascribed to me uh, i don't feel that i sit in that anymore and what i discovered about myself was that my mood swings that change on a dime um are much more attributed to the energetics that I feel that they're actually what make me such a powerful healer now. And certainly Mm. no one was having that conversation with me while I was in therapy that, that maybe some of these (laughs) things that made me need to be on medication, uh, would actually be powerful tools for me one day. And so, Mm. um, yeah, then doing the work to heal the things that I was self-sabotaging over and doing the work to, um, heal the depression and, yeah, it's, it's, I don't think that uh, clinicians have it all figured out, but now I've learned how to operate in my own neuroses and to show up in just a different way that, that people misunderstand all the time. They look at you and they have, oh, I see you now in this context and this is my perception of you. And um, mm. it's like the iceberg, like you said, there's so much more below the surface. Yeah, it's an interesting... Um... I think it's an interesting time we're in where the, the, there is there is already pushback from the medical industrial complex for this idea of self healing. Mm. Uh, so and this is where you hear the word the word pseudoscience banded around a lot, referring to practices and modalities that are thousands of years old, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pseudoscience. It it predates your science. Um, but setting that debate aside, I think I think we're in an interesting place now where for the for the next few years at least, we're, we're gonna have this clash. I think the more people who do this uh adopt these various conscious practices, be it breath work, meditation, sound healing, um, yoga, of course, 
uh, and psychedelics, we're going to continue having these clashes because, it, you know, if, if you were to, I, I'm not a, I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not even a guru. I'm a man on the mend. That's, mm. that's all I can say about me. But, but, but in that journey of, of mending myself, it worked. And actually, I've, I've, as a result of that, I've, dis, I've uh, interacted with many, 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 many people who have done exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. They've mended themselves. They're not, not altogether ourselves, of course. We had shaman and we had therapists and we had body workers and we had yoga teachers and we had breathwork um, facilitators. So we were held. But ultimately, we took responsibility we assumed our own sovereignty we stepped into our power to heal ourselves and and fundamentally that's what makes us heroes on the hero's journey as far as i'm concerned because mm -hmm. we are we live in an age where actually we've handed over uh, our sovereignty to the medical industrial complex now please i'm not disrespecting the medical industry i'm not disrespecting years of um of uh, qualifications in practice and, of course, successes. But what I am saying is that, um, for example, when we talk about the, uh, the, the, the scattergun prescription of um, antidepressants, I do wonder if, if, there's, if there's room for debate ar around how effective that is um, and, and actually whether or not we're just treating symptoms and not, and not trauma. And the mm -hmm. likes of Gabor Mate would talk about this uh, significantly more eloquently than I. But um, and I'm, I'm just I'm actually just reading um, a book. It's quite an old book. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh you read yeah, that? I've heard it. Yeah. All right. That's uh, what's he called? Bessel van Kock. and he is a psychiatrist, and 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 he was one of the the the, uh, the pioneers, if you like, of using pharmaceuticals in um psychological and, and psychiatric environments um and ultimately what he gets around to saying is look i was one of the pioneers in this space but then i started to question all of it mm. i started to question um what we were doing and how frequently we were prescribing these things because of course when especially when you're talking about prescribing antipsychotics to people who have significant mental illness they saw these dramatic changes. Um, mm -hmm. They saw calming. Um, but but uh, my, my point is that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a space amidst all of that, I think, where we can, we can be having some more conscious conversations about how do we treat trauma mm. using these ancient practices, using psychedelics, microdosing psilocybin, for example, as we know, um, has had some f phenomenal effects. And actually, again, I talk about this in the book, but there's, I quote a number of um, studies uh, that all show incredible healing effects for various mental illnesses, from ADHD to alcoholism um, to uh, severe depression. And they're quoting anything from psilocybin to mescaline to DMT. Um, and all of these things are still being held back. You know, mm -hmm. I, we're talking about criminalization or, or rather decriminalization. I think it's absolutely absurd that anybody believes that you can criminalize or patent nature. Right. It's an absurdity to me. And actually, yes, we should in the, in the community be celebrating these small wins. Oh, great. Look, they've, they're now saying that you can actually, that, that you can use, you can do clinical trials using psilocybin. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, with the greatest respect in the world. I don't care what these authorities have to say about this stuff. I don't care if these authorities are doing this trial or that trial. And, and in 10 years, if we're really lucky, um, then we might be allowed to use these medicines. And, and frankly, I, I'm, I'm almost suggesting uh, a peaceful revolution here mm. where we stop expressing so much gratitude to the medical industrial complex and to these governments who incidentally stand to make a significant amount of money out of this um, decriminalization and patenting. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, we, we've got to get back to basics here. You know, how can it be possible? How can it be in any place 
possible, uh, like remotely arguable that I can't pick a mushroom out of a field and say, oh, yes, this happens to be a psilocybin mushroom and eat it. And the moment I eat it, I'm breaking the law. That's insane. I mean, you know, obviously I'm stating the obvious and I'm sure, you, you know, this is a conversation we all have in this space. But I, this is the, the problem with life in the matrix. We've become so conditioned. Mm hmm. You know, you can't do this. You can't do that. You need a permit for this. There's a fine for that. Or you need a certificate if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm stepping into my sovereignty. I'm, I'm, I'm embracing my, my natural power as a creative being. Now, obviously, I'm not going to start smashing in 10 grams of, of psilocybin um, without doing the research. Or, incidentally, I don't recommend yeah. anybody does 10 nope, grams don't of start 9 there. grams of foreign. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that definitely don't start on 10 grams. No. Um, but, but the point is, obviously, these medicines uh, and these practices should be done responsibly. Um, but then that's, you know, that's the basics, isn't it? Well, the basics of, of, a, of having a great psychedelic experience, set, setting, guide. Mm. That's it. That's the three things. And, you know, so many people talk, oh, dangerous. These things are dangerous. You shouldn't be doing that. You, you're not, you're not um, qualified to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. doing these things it's dangerous um and of course yes it is dangerous if you if you don't have the right mindset if you haven't cleansed your body if you haven't stepped into an environment where actually you're in a safe space with with the right people and with the right guide and then you and then you give yourself a a dmt or a mescaline dose yeah you are likely to have what they call a bad trip mm -hmm. news flash yeah. You know, but obviously if we follow the, um, if we follow the basics, the rules, then, uh, then we're going to be okay. I went off on a tangent there. I apologize. I need to climb back down from my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I love you on your soapbox though. Like I think that was one of the things I apologize things that... to everyone listening. That was a rant. <laughs> you know, but it's great. I, I love like also your podcast is like two and a half hours long per episode. And I just, I love long podcasts. So for me, mine are usually around an hour long and that kills me right. that they're not longer um, because I just, I look to like Joe Rogan as such a beautiful example of what your podcast can be when you don't yeah. give a fuck. And so yeah. <laughs> while it's I- It's hard though, isn't it? I mean, I- how have we how have we been doing anyway? How are we uh, over like an, an hour? We're like an hour now. twenty minutes right now, which is great. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry about that. Yeah, but, I, I tend to we have the we have the same debate as you probably do, and that is the algorithm, or, or rather the the reports, the um, the dashboard data that you get often says, oh, actually, you lost a lot of your audience after an hour, and mm. uh, you know we we constantly battle with that because we we don't want to be rambling away about nonsense that uh, that bores people. But ultimately, how do you ever how do you ever condense all of this exciting stuff that we want to talk about into one hour? You know, it's, it's, it's oh impossible, gosh. isn't it? Yeah. And I've been on some other podcasts that are like half an hour and I'm like, uh, we like, what do you, you just get to talk about like one thing and then explain what you do and that's yeah. it. Like, and I'm like, that's too, points. <laughs> yeah, it's too rushed. And like, like you, I love to talk. So, I mean, sign me up for this conversation. And I love to listen. And that was yeah. something that just drew me to you so much was, I, like I said, I've, um, I've listened to some of your episodes two and three times just because I was like, mm, the sound of Martin's voice. And you're so, you're so in touch with your knowledge as well. So I deeply honor that about you, your ability to recall it at will, um, I find inspiring. And I might be hiding behind the excuse that like I've hit my head a lot as an action sports athlete that... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I've taken enough psilocybin that I'm pretty sure I'm rewired correctly. <laughs> so. Yeah, your neurogenesis is complete. Yeah. Well, we sometimes it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? When you are uh, when you're doing podcasts or talking about th talking about your field, it's um, there, there's only so much we can remember, isn't there? I mean, that, mm. This book is is got, is absolutely stuffed with facts and oh, quotes. Yeah. Uh, from people significantly wiser than me. I mean, you know, Lao Tzu, just Lao Tzu on his own in the Tao Te Ching, this this this, um, this Taoist master. That that wisdom, I could I could uh, spew that out for for ten episodes uh, and not get uh, tired. But I can't I couldn't remember it all. You know, that's the mm. problem, isn't it? There is there is so much incredible wisdom already out there in the world. So yeah, I suppose I. I you know, part of my ex my experience, my healing experience has been to really embrace this new life. Mm. 
Mm. You know, I, I, I died. I died and I was, I was born again. And, you know, some people might find that quite triggering language. Um, cause it's, you know, I, I, I guess it's got Christian undertones as well, but, um, but, it, but I did, you know, I, I had what many would refer to as an ego death. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would call it a near death experience or a, or a rewriting of a soul contract, if you like, mm. but having come back from that, man, you know, I'm 47 years old now. Um, and l- last week I celebrated five years sober. And I just, I fucking love being alive. I love it. And I'm, I'm now at the point where every day there's, I have a gratitude practice. I, I have lots of modalities and little util, utilities to ensure that I'm present, that I'm aware, um, that I'm connected, that I'm accepting. You know, these are all of the, the, the these things that I've learned from, from these masters and from, mm-hmm from my friends in the astral, mm. <laughs> you know, courtesy of these. Friends. So it's, yeah, I, I love quoting uh, other people's wisdom because I, I, it's timeless and it ought to be requoted. And, mm-hmm. and actually we're in danger of, um, of forgetting a lot of this knowledge. You know, mm-hmm. that's the, that's the, the I, 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 where we're at now we're in a, in a matrix full of consumerist, materialist distraction where we're about to embark in this uh, the evolution of the metaverse where your avatar can have an avatar oh, illusions inside illusions yeah you know i mean we're moving further away from um from uh from source and from mm-hmm. from a concept of divinity if we're not careful i mean i don't i don't want to be a, a doomsayer because we're not all in that space but but i think now more than ever it's, it's a good time to be sharing what Buddha said a few thousand years ago, or what Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, or what Confucius said. Because actually, you know, these, these Eastern philosophies have a lot more in common with modern day psychology than most Western religions and philosophies. Stave, uh, save Stoicism. Stoic, the Stoics have got a, a really good perspective on life. And of course, that came from the Romans, didn't it? So, um, so yeah, I love, a, I love a good quote. Yeah, and, and it is evident in your book. And one of the things I loved about it, which is also, I mean, you just like wrote the book that I wanted to write. Um, it's so chock full of the science and references and backing everything up with um, other people who've already done the work around the topics. And I just, mm. it's so beautiful. Um, and I believe you have queued up an excerpt from your book uh, for me to share with my listeners. I have, yeah. I've recorded the audiobook version of it in a studio here in Bali. And uh, so I asked the team to set up a couple of cameras um, to make a, a, a nice exclusive uh, piece of content. And so it's, uh, it's chapter 20 and it's called Shadow Work. And here it is. Chapter 20, Shadow Work. Shadow Work is the path of the heart warrior. Carl Jung. It was in early 2019 that broken and barley bound, I left the UK. I had sold or given away everything I owned and with just two bags and a beagle, after an arduous road trip across Java, I arrived at a seaside town on Bali's east coast with little inkling of what lay ahead. I'd gravitated to the island of the gods with no real plan whatsoever. No strategy, mentor, family, friends or clue about how I would spend my days. Nevertheless, I was instinctively cognizant of where the real work should begin. And so I initiated what I later learned was to be my shadow work. While not exclusive to the island, an expression known as spiritual bypassing regularly makes its rounds in Bali. Introduced by the Buddhist psychotherapist John Wellwood, the term is defined as using spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep personal, emotional, unfinished business, to shore up a shaky sense of self, or to belittle basic needs, feelings, and developmental tasks. When spiritually bypassing, we use such practices to cover up our emotional and psychological shortcomings, a spiritualized smokescreen for us and others. 
we dive into new techniques, skipping the critical healing phase known as shadow work. So what is it? Well, it derives from another Jungian concept, shadow self, essentially getting to grips with the parts of our personality that we reject out of fear or shame. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we all have a shadow and the self-reflective work necessary is a deep dive into one's shadow self. The purpose is to fully see and know it, to sit with the searing pain of who that self is and has been, and to ultimately embrace it as a welcome and most beloved part of us. Honestly, it's no fun. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a good fun. It's a good fun piece. That do you want to talk about that briefly, or I think we've kind of talked yeah. about shadow work, haven't you? I, we, I suppose I can I can I can give a a, a a sixty second overview of it. The you know the whole point in that chapter, as as, as uh, people have now heard, is it's it's really shadow work is really all about owning your bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no there's no two ways about it. It's 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 about taking a long hard stare at yourself and saying i have been a dick mm. um but then doing it with love you know that's the point and i and i i will talk i that book i talk about shadow work several times in the book because i'm, I'm constantly reminding people as tempting as it is to go from traumatized to five grams of psilocybin don't do it you know, yeah. or if you do do it, then make sure that you integrate that with mm. some actual work in the present without the use of these medicines um, where you're developing, you know, a daily practice, a meditation practice or or a movement practice, whatever it is that works for you to 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 move that blocked emotion. You mm -hmm. know? Lee, uh, Lee Holden, the Qigong master who, who wrote the foreword for the book, he talks about this a lot. He talks about uh, emotion being energy in motion Ooh. so obvious right yeah. but we don't think about it it's it's blocked energy we you know when um uh van Kock talks about uh, the body keeping the score that's one of the things he's talking about he's talking about somatics how all of our traumatic uh and pleasurable experiences are are, 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 are locked in there you know mm -hmm. and so trauma gets locked in the body and we have to get it out some in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Uh, it's the only way we can move forward, but you've got to do the work repeatedly and, and practice to, to shift all of that stuff. Absolutely. And that's why I call what I do being a five dimensional healer. Um, I work as a massage therapist on the body and I can actually tap into pressure points and places where that trauma is stored to release it. Um, I work on the mind. So helping with that shadow work and to reframe situations and um, the spirit as well. So the energy healing and tying that in with the psychedelics and the astral dimensions to really have a transformational shift of someone in their life and how they, they show up every day. Um, and I, I wish that upon Beautiful. everybody. Yeah, I mean, what more could we wish um, than for everybody to experience this incredible process of healing mm -hmm. before it's too late? You know, right. it's, it's really the whole point, isn't it? You know, would you rather be addressing all of your deathbed regrets now mm -hmm. when you're not dying or when it's too late? You know, right. and that's that, that's the fundamental point. Um and the reality is we can do it anytime, you know, we can change, we can choose to change anytime. Yeah. And it's so, you know, we, we talk, what's the expression? You can't teach, um, can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can, because I'm an old dog and I taught <laughs> myself a few new tricks. Uh, and, and ultimately it's really simple, isn't it? You, we're either, we're either choosing it or we're not. And, and I think, you know, if, if what we're not choosing Sorry, what we're not changing, we are choosing as well. Mm. Simple as that. So um, it doesn't have to be revolutionary, you know, okay, go from zero to the to an incredible, uh, incredibly lit up, uh, constantly smiling like a lunatic, happy person like me. It's, um, <laughs> you know, it's all about small incremental changes. Uh, mm. But ultimately any change is change, you know, mm. you know 
celebrate those changes as well. I think that's a piece of advice I have. Remember the milestone, you know, these, sorry, it's not really about milestones or rather it's about celebrating the milestones rather than constantly having your eyes on the goal at the end. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a walking cliche today. I'm talking, I'm using all of these, um, these saccharine pros, but it's about enjoying the journey instead of focusing on the destination, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, which is something I, something I learned very late in life, having mm-hmm. spent my, my whole adult life in a, in a very successful career with a lot of stuff uh, and, you know, what I thought was success. And it right. turns out it wasn't success at all. It was just a life of distraction and depression. Which you address in the book as well, how to sort of go about getting rid of those things and how to minimize and downsize, which um, is just a beautiful segue into where can where can my listeners find your book? Where would you like to steer them towards purchasing it so they can add it to their collection of possessions? Uh, yeah, and, but, but if you do follow the chapter on minimalism, you'll see that I say, if you're going to buy a new thing, then, then you have to get rid of an old thing. So perhaps <laughs> uh, when you buy my book, then make sure you either sell or give away a book. Uh, so then, then you're keeping that equilibrium. Yeah, well, uh, How to Die Happy is available on, on Amazon Worldwide, and uh, it's available as a paperback, a Kindle, and an audio book. Mm. Or if you're in Bali, it's available in stores various stores so uh i How guess exciting you know look me up look me up if you're on the island of bali and i'll uh, i'll meet you for a coconut and uh, and point you in the direction of a bookstore uh, mm-hmm. the audio book i'm really excited about because um i i went around the the island and around indonesia we've, we've done a lot of traveling with a field recorder Ooh. and i've got ambient sounds from the from the rainforest from the jungle a beach at night uh you know, a forest in the morning. So you've got these beautiful uh, sounds of the nature and they're, they're all integrated into the, into the audio book with some meditations. So uh, oh, cool. yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite an epic uh, piece of sound engineering, but it's a nice book. Yeah, which is fun actually, because you and I talked about that before you recorded it. And I was like, I love the sounds of Bali in the background of your podcast. And you're like, oh, speaking of which, I've been thinking about putting those in the background. And I just thought naturally that you would go to the same coffee shop and and read the book there out loud. But I didn't realize you would actually go out, record the sounds, and then put it in the background. Next level. Yeah, next level. Well, I it actually, I, I had already recorded them. I just didn't know what I was going to do with it. So, uh, yeah, we've. Hmm. I don't know. If, well, you either know or you don't. But there are, I think, forty-seven thousand Indonesian islands. It's a. There are oh, a Jesus. lot of islands here. Some incredible places. You know, people. I think often think of Java and Bali as the the main islands, but no, there you know there are thousands more. So, mm-hmm. and uh, Jules, my partner, and I have, have traveled around uh, quite a lot, nowhere near extensively. There's a lot more of Indonesia for us to see, but yeah, we took the field recorder out. We've got some. Uh, Jules actually reads um, because the book is interjected um, here and there with prayers and meditations, um, mm. breath exercise. Um, you know, a Taoist prayer, a Buddhist prayer, that sort of thing. And Jules reads them all, but she reads them all with this, you know, with this lovely sound of the sea or the birds tweeting or deep in the rainforest, you know, you can hear the frogs. Or it's, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Gosh, nice I, I'm going to have to get the audiobook version as well, just so I can read Yay! consume the information. <laughs> Please do. But the only yeah. downside is you have to listen to me reading the book. I love uh, listening to a, you, though. So it's a perk. It's a perk. <laughs> well, it's very kind of you to say. I don't know. I, you know, whenever I listen to an audio book, so I've listened to some incredible audio books, which were just not well narrated. You know, mm-hmm. great books, international best-selling books, but just not well narrated. And, and it, re- it really affected my experience of them. And so I wanted to record this myself. I wanted to narrate it myself because I figured surely – this is my voice and, and my writing style is very much me you know mm-hmm. the, the way you hear me communicating now as you've read the book so you get that right yeah. um i wanted to ensure that that readers really felt uh, felt the words the way i i wanted them to feel to be felt if that makes sense so mm. yeah i hope i hope people enjoy the audiobook it was yeah. a real fun experience making it mm. Well, thank you so much for for sharing your time and space with me today. We will have your audiobook linked up in the show notes as well as your social media and uh, any other any other places people can find you or that you'd like to steer them towards. 
Uh, no, just uh, the, just check out the book website, which is uh, howtodiehappybook.com, or of course our podcast, which is howtodiehappypodcast.com. Um, and hey, Barrett, thank you so much for having me. I've really, really enjoyed speaking to you. And I, I, I love what you're doing with the Modern Hippie uh, podcast. I wish you every success with it. I love the, the, the concept of it. I love the people you get on board. Love your energy. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. And um, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for everything you bring into the world. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. And yeah, thank you again for joining me. And until next time. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and review this podcast wherever you're listening. I'm so grateful to have you on this journey with me. Until next time.